It's 6 p.m. on Wednesday here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Hwang Ji-hae. And these are the headlines we're following at this hour. During her sixth summit talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping, President Park Geun-hye expresses gratitude to Beijing for its role in diffusing tensions on the Korean Peninsula. While the South Korean leader makes her trip to China, North Korea continues to flip-flop over statements from the recent landmark deal between the two Koreas. Plus, global stock markets remain jittery as sluggish manufacturing figures from China and the United States fuel concerns of slowing growth for major economies. President Park Geun-hye in Beijing to attend World War II victory celebrations held talks with President Xi Jinping, alluding to the recent escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula prompted by North Korea's landmine attack in the demilitarized zone. President Park thanked Beijing for its constructive role that led to a landmark inter-Korean deal to defuse tensions. She added that the situation showed households' cooperation with Beijing is crucial in achieving regional peace. Expressing gratitude towards President Park for attending the war victory events, the Chinese leader said, the relations between the two countries have developed to their highest point. President Xi also said Beijing is against any kind of acts that could trigger tensions on the Korean Peninsula. She also hosted a special luncheon for President Park, the only leader of a U.S. allied nation, to attend the ceremonies. Now, this just coming in, the two sides say a meaningful six-party talks should take place soon and a three-way summit talks between Seoul, Beijing and Tokyo is set to occur around the period between late October and early November. Yeah, we're just a day away from the war victory celebrations where China is set to display its military power for the many high-profile officials and heads of state attending from all over the world. Kim Hyun-bin gives us a closer look at the ceremony. China has been preparing for the 70th anniversary ceremony of China's victory over Japan in World War II for months. Beijing has come a long way over the years to now stand just behind the United States, both economically and militarily. Fittingly, the ceremony serves as a chance for China to show off its economic and military power to the world. The highlight of the ceremony will be the largest ever military parade held in the heart of Beijing, with over 80 percent of the weaponry on display for the first time. State-of-the-art intercontinental ballistic missiles, hundreds of warplanes, and high-tech weaponry will be showcased. The parade will begin with honor guards on the front line, followed by a procession of 12,000 troops from all branches marching in sync, displaying China's military prowess. President Park Geun-hye, North Korea's Secretary of the North Workers' Party, Choi ryong hye Russian President Vladimir Putin, and UN Secretary General Pang Ki-moon are among the 49 officials and heads of state scheduled to be in attendance for the massive parade. A commemoration ceremony will take place after the parade, where Chinese President Xi Jinping will take the podium to award veterans with military medals. Numerous cultural events are also scheduled to take place in the evening, under the theme, Victory and Peace. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. While momentum builds up for South Korea-China relations, North Korea seems to be retracting its promises made in the landmark inter-Korean agreement reached last week. The regime warned Seoul to stop interpreting the words to its own advantage. Hwang sung reports. Is North Korea trying to go back on its word? The regime's National Defense Commission said Wednesday that South Korea is interpreting the North's words for its own advantage and warned such actions could dampen relations. The statement comes just a week after a landmark inter-Korean agreement. Pyongyang had expressed regret over the recent landmine explosion that left two South Korean soldiers seriously injured, which Seoul considers equivalent to an apology by international standards. In response to the North's claim that regret does not mean apology, South Korea's unification ministry said this was not the time to be quarreling over the agreement. It is not the time to argue about what's right or what's wrong. I reiterate that it is time for South and North Korea to sincerely implement and follow what has been agreed together. Experts say North Korea's latest remarks should not be taken too seriously since it is most likely intended for a domestic audience. Uh, but I think a lot of the domestic 
uh, factors are playing into this somewhat, given that the North Koreans did not really come out on top in this negotiation. And so they would have to sell um, while still at the same time saving face. Mm -hmm. As for to what extent the statement will affect the inter-Korean agreement, they say it depends on whether South Korea wants to move beyond simple talks to more substantive matters to improve future relations. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the United States has a clear message to North Korea following its recent military provocation. Washington's defense chief says Pyongyang should consider the military power of the U.S. and its allies if it chooses to act out again. Kim Jian reports. U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter warned North Korea Tuesday that it would have no chance if it attacks South Korea. At a webcast event with U.S. troops stationed around the world, Carter said the North should understand the consequences of any provocation and noted the real possibility of war breaking out on the Korean Peninsula. We need to uh, make sure that the North Koreans always understand that any provocation uh, with them will be dealt with and that they stand no chance of uh, defeating us and our allies in South Korea. And probably the single place on the world in the world where war could erupt at the snap of our fingers. Carter's remarks come a little over a week after inter-Korean tensions flared to levels unseen in years. The two Koreas ended a military standoff that triggered an exchange of artillery fire after Seoul reinstated its propaganda broadcast in retaliation for the North's landmine blast that seriously wounded two South Korean soldiers. Seoul and Pyongyang are technically still at war since the Korean War ended in a truce rather than a peace treaty. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Moving on to domestic politics, labor market reforms continue to make headlines over at the National Assembly. The ruling's Henry Party chief Kim Musang put the reforms as the party's top priority during his parliamentary address on Wednesday. Kim Young Gil has more. The ruling bloc's chief identified labor market reform as the core item on its agenda for the second half of this year, calling it the key to boosting the nation's slowing economy and generating jobs for the youth. The ultimate goal of the labor reforms is to create jobs, especially for the young, and reduce labor costs to stimulate corporate investment. We also want to create a business-friendly environment to improve performance and encourage new investments. Kim said job creation would lead to economic growth and provide welfare for the people. He added that labor market reform was the cornerstone for headway on other reforms, reiterating the need to reorganize the entire workforce and labor market system. The ruling party chief also promised to push ahead with reforms regarding how major conglomerates or tebal are run. Public resentment is growing over how family control conglomerates are running their vast empires and the outmoded governance structure, which often leads to ugly fights. We must also stop conglomerates from gaining profit through unfair transactions in the market. However, he stressed that reform should not be used to drag the conglomerates down or promote anti-corporate sentiment. Kim also promised to uphold President Park Geun-hye's four major reform drives centered on the labor, public, finance and education sectors. Responding to Kim Musong's speech, the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy's chief, Moon Jae-in, said it lacked content on how to reform the conglomerates and added that Kim made no mention of raising corporate taxes. Kim young Arirang News. More and more Chinese tourists are making the short flight across the West Sea now that Korea is declared free of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. The outbreak scared tens of thousands of Chinese away, but local retailers say sales are finally on the rebound. Kim min has the details. They're back. The number of Chinese visitors shopping at Korea's department and duty-free stores is back on the recovery track after being hit hard due to the recent MERS outbreak. Industry officials say Chinese tourist spending is approaching levels seen last year. Lotte Duty Free, the country's biggest duty-free chain, says its sales during the last week of August were down only 5% from the same period a year ago. 
Although sales have yet to return to normal, it's looking much brighter than the peak of the MERS scare in June and July, when sales slumped by up to 50 percent. However, market watchers say it's going to take time for sales figures to return to levels seen early this year. During the January to May period before MERS shook Korea's economy, the growth rate of sales to Chinese tourists stood at over 50 percent on year on average. In what could be a turning point for Korean retailers, China's calendar is packed with holidays from the end of September. China's mid-autumn festival falls on the last weekend of September, and it's followed by a week-long National Day holiday, usually the peak season for Chinese tourists flocking to Korea. And to take full advantage, the local retail industry is busy preparing events to lure big-spending Chinese visitors. Samsung Group Shell Hotel and Amusement Park Everland will hold a session in China to promote local tourism, while most department stores and duty-free chains will be showering tourists who spend a certain amount with gift vouchers and other freebies. Lotte Duty Free will host a concert in the southeastern port city of Busan, where roughly half of the participants are expected to be Chinese visitors. On top of this, the Seoul Family Concert has also been rescheduled to October, with more than 20,000 Chinese tourists likely to attend. Kim min Arirang News. Despite the retail industry witnessing a rebound in sales due to the return of Chinese tourists, it wasn't the case last month. Korea's travel account deficit hit a seven-year high in July as a result of the MERS outbreak. The Bank of Korea says the deficit came to around one and a half billion U.S. dollars on the back of travel cancellations due to the outbreak. The central bank says the number of inbound travelers dropped 50 percent in July from a year ago. A travel account deficit occurs when the money spent by Koreans abroad exceeds the total spent by foreigners in Korea. Korea posted yet another current account surplus in July, extending its surplus streak to 41 months. The current account surplus stood at $10.1 billion, up nearly 30 percent from a year ago. The surplus was mainly due to a fall in the balance of goods. The negative effects of sluggish manufacturing in the world's major economies are continuing to spill over into global stock markets. Adding to the gloom, the head of the International Monetary Fund has warned that global economic growth is likely to fall short of previous expectations. Kwon Soa tells us more. Market watchers expected global stock markets to stabilize this week. But risks from China refused to go away, as evidenced in further falls on major U.S. and European bourses following disappointing economic data from August, especially a decline in China's manufacturing sector. China's official manufacturing purchasing managers index dropped to 49.7 last month, a three-year low and lower than earlier projections. A figure below 50 suggests manufacturing activity is contracting. The same index fell to an almost two-year low in the United States last month to 53, and the Eurozone posted a contraction too. Slowing manufacturing, especially in China, means less demand for crude oil, adding to concerns that oil prices will drop even further. The worries are sparking fears of slower global growth as well. The head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, warned on Tuesday that global economic growth is likely to be weaker than earlier expected due to a slower recovery in advanced economies and a further slowdown in emerging nations. China commodities, uh, the monetary policy of the Fed could actually have a, a headwind effect on uh, most economies, but particularly on emerging market economies and could induce volatility. Uh, as, as we have seen already and, and will continue to see a little bit. Lagarde acknowledged that China's economy is slowing as it transitions into more of a market-based economy. She also cautioned that the near future could be bumpy for emerging economies that are highly reliant on the world's second biggest economy for trade. And that would include Korea. The nation's exports to China in August nosedived 8.8 percent compared to the same month last year. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. 
Families here in Korea spend big to make sure their son or daughter's wedding day is perfection. This weighs heavily on many parents as they're culturally obligated to fork out tens of thousands of dollars for an expensive wedding ceremony. And a recent survey shows that the burden is much heavier for the groom's parents than the bride's. Son Jung-in has more. There is a sizable gap between the men and the women when it comes to wedding costs, well, at least for their parents. According to data from the Korean Women's Development Institute, Korean parents spent an average of over 80 million won or roughly 68,000 U.S. dollars when they married off their son. The average cost for daughters? Less than 60 million won or 51,000 dollars. The Ministry of Gender Equality and Family released the data Wednesday following a survey of 1,200 parents and their adult children who tied the knot within the last three years. It's hard to find married couples who had a stereotypical Korean wedding ceremony without receiving any financial support from their parents. Only 10 percent of newlyweds said they paid for their special day entirely out of their own pocket. The survey shows that it's still a prevailing notion in Korea that it's the parents' responsibility to help pay for the wedding, especially when they have the ability to do so. That's not to say parents don't feel pressure covering the cost. Over 93 percent of the parents surveyed said they never expressed their stress over the wedding cost to their in-laws. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. That brings us to the end of our newscast. More updates coming up at 10 p.m. Korea time. Stay tuned and goodbye for now.